All right. The common question is how do I document what I have done in MATLAB? Okay. So any assignment that has a MATLAB part, if you are writing a function, give me a printout of the function, uh, with your name on it, okay. and then uh, interaction with the MATLAB, by that I mean uh, whatever you have entered on the command line, and uh, MATLAB echoes back. For example, if you are uh, calling ODE45 uh, with certain name, whatever, blah, 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 okay? I want a copy of this ideally, but not for this assignment, because I have not shown you yet, okay? So if you have done this assignment already, fine. From next assignment onward, uh, follow this trick. And this trick is to, there is a command called diary, and then you can give it a file name, okay? So, for example, as01.text. Okay. So, once you enter that command, what it's going to do is keep an echo of everything that happened between you and MATLAB. So, if I type a command, if I say a is equal to 2, or, okay, so it will have a copy of that in that file, just a text file. Okay. So, it will keep a copy of that in that file. And that file you can submit. Okay. So, and uh, you can. For example, if you are debugging and you want to not record this, I think diary has a feature called diary off, which turns off that. And from that point on, you can test out whatever things you don't want it in that file, okay? And then you can restart the process again, okay? And to continue to add, if you give the same file name, it will continue to add to that. Diary on, or did you say diary for that file? Uh, you're gonna overwrite. Now you're asking good questions. I think you should find the answer by yourself. <laughs> I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> okay. So my expectation is if I say diary, I mean, it's very easy to check it. Okay. So diary on, okay, and then I can try B is equal to 3. And uh, uh, then I need to know where the, the other common problem from past experience is you don't know where it is saved. Where do you think the file is saved? In the past. In right there. Okay, so it will be stored in the current path, whatever the path is. So if you change the path, then you will not be able to find it. So let's just see where it is. <laughs> Obviously, it didn't do that. Find the answer. So when it says there it is, then it's putting in into a default file, uh, file name. Okay, so that's probably simply diary. Okay, so you need to let, let's do this. this. This is how you learn. This is how I learn. Okay, uh, as I said, MATLAB is so big that I don't know everything about it. Okay, so I'm now specifying the same name, and. and what happened. This also you should be able to do, speculate. Okay. So what I did before was I said B equal to 3, and I didn't close the diary off. That's probably the reason I didn't get an echo of that in that. If that is true, then I entered B equal to 3 again, and then I closed off the diary. So it have pushed all the buffer into that file, and if that is true, I should have that entry twice. Let's try it. So this is what you should be able to be bold enough to kind of experiment with it and learn. Okay? You are raising good questions. Part of learning is to find the answers yourself also. Because I'm not going to be there all the time. Okay? So um, you should develop this confidence. Okay, so that answers the question on how to document it. Okay? Any other questions? Otherwise, technically you find the assignment reasonable, right? You just spend a lot of time here. Uh, simply because what happened was when I entered diary on, it did open the file again to be returned to that. Okay, so when I entered B equal to three, it was going to write to that. But unless I say diary off, it just keeps all the record of the diary in the memory. But once I say off, oh, okay, it says I'm going to push all these to the file. Okay, that's what is happening. I think. So if you do all your work and it's like diary 
I wouldn't risk that because you don't know how much it keeps in the memory, right? It can keep only a finite memory and then flush out the older one. Okay. So if you want to capture it directly on, and then you can always go back and edit it. If there are two entries, you can go and delete one. You can edit it using a notepad or something like that. That's just the text part. Okay. Um, all right. So far in the course, we have kind of uh, finished the first topic, which is basically to understand a little bit about dynamic models, a little bit about what are control ideas, some of the ideas in the control scheme. Why do we need control? How do we go about getting the best set point? And how do we implement some very simple uh, control actions? But the most important part is how do I develop a dynamic model and how do I analyze it? Okay? I'm going to put uh, a chapter from a kind of book that I'm writing that's on entirely on models. So there are about 20, 30 models in there. And uh, I'll put it as a reading material on models for you to look at it. Some of the problems may end up in assignments and exams. You may want to take a look at it. Okay? Uh, but this, of course, is not about building models. Okay? It's about uh, understanding control algorithms for models. So model building is an essential part which you're supposed to know already. And the last lecture, we spent quite a bit of time with MATLAB itself. I hope it was uh, useful. MATLAB itself has a lot of demo videos as well. Uh, I don't know if you have found it out yet. So if you go to demos on the top, okay, um, it has a lot of tutorial type of material. Okay, very useful, very useful. And many of them are just videos. So basically, they have done the same thing that I'm doing in the class. Captured it as they demonstrate various aspects of MATLAB, whether it is graphing, whether it is using uh, simple workspace functions and things like that. And each are very short, five to ten minutes or so. So I think you'll find it uh, quite uh, useful to learn. Uh, <coughs> and we saw uh, very briefly the integral action does bring down uh, the offset that only the proportional action has. And for systems with large capacity, the response is attenuated. And we saw the reason why. And we also saw that the overly aggressive control action can lead to instability, even though we didn't really quantify how to characterize instability. That's going to be a major part of this course, understanding what we mean by stability and how do we design control systems that remain stable. And we saw the block diagram representation of such a system. So the next couple of lectures, I'm going to talk about Laplace transform. It's basically a review. You have done it, but I'm sure you have forgotten it too. So don't use it, you forget, right? So we'll quickly go through uh, some of the definitions, some of uh, the rules and properties of Laplace transform and why it is so useful for us. Because we are dealing with dynamical systems, ordinary differential equations. Laplace transform is an excellent way of solving these because they convert a differential equation into an algebraic equation. Once you are understanding that link between differential equation, dynamical system, and Laplace transform, the rest of the course we are going to be dealing only with in the transform space. We can design our control strategy entirely in the transform space, meaning dealing only with algebraic equations. So it's an extremely useful link from this point. Now, the, do you understand what we mean by transform? Just from memory, or have you done any other type of transform, integral transforms in your math course? What does the transform do? It's an operation. It's a rule. Okay. So it's a generalization of simple ideas that we know. For example, if I give you function f equals x squared, it's a rule that says that if you tell me what is the value of x, I can tell you the value of f. So I can plot f versus x. So if x is 1, f is 1. If x is 2, f is 4, etc. So I can develop a mapping like this. Okay? So this is a rule. So in the same sense, integral transforms are also rules. But here, this rule transfers numbers to other numbers. And if integral transforms, transfers functions to other functions using a certain rule. Okay. And there are a number of rules, and the Laplace uh, transform is one that we are going to look at. And here is a brief history. Uh, another great source that I find is Wikipedia. Okay. You can go there and find information on almost any subject. And here is a page that I have pulled from Wikipedia, a history behind the uh, Laplace transform and other transforms. This is just for your reading pressure. I'm not going to go through what's in there. But I'm going to just, I just want to illustrate the idea, the concept of what a transform is. Okay. So here, for example, in this transform, you have x 
as a variable in the original function, and you multiply this by some function s, phi of x. And you raise that x to the power s, integrate it, and you have to identify certain limits. It could be 0 to infinity or minus infinity to infinity. And in the process, you are getting rid of the original variable x. And what you get is a new function, which is a function of s. So the original function has been transformed to a new function using this rule. Okay? And why are these rules useful? Why do they de define integral transform? Because they are extremely useful. Different types of integral transforms are useful for solving different uh, differential equations. Laplace transform is particularly useful for solving uh, ODE. Okay? So the formal definition of the Laplace transform is the following. If you give me some function, some arbitrary function f of t, function typically we use t as the independent variable because we are dealing with dynamic system, time is the independent variable. So some function which is a function of time, and I want the Laplace transform of the function. How do I define it? I define it by simply taking that function, f of t, always multiply it by e to the power minus s t, and integrate with respect to t between the limits 0, minus, and infinity. What does this mean? From 0 to infinity, including 0. Okay. So the function, this transform is not defined for values of t less than 0. And that's simply because t has a typical interpretation of time in dynamical systems, and you can start t equal to 0 at any instant and look forward. Okay? So you really don't care as to what happened in the previous history. Now, s is allowed to be a complex variable. I don't have a computation to add to this. Right? And you also know complex variables right now. Right? Learned and forgotten, maybe, but they will remind when, when we need it. Okay? So that is the definition of a Laplace transform. Okay? Uh, as proposed by Laplace, is basically take the function, multiply by e to the power minus st, carry out the integral, and what you get is a new function, and we'll typically represent this as capital Fs. The original function is represented as lowercase as t, the transform function is represented as capital F which is the function of a new variable x, the transformed variable. Okay? Why is this important? Why do we do this? Why do we define these new rules? Not to complicate our life, but to actually simplify our life. Okay? So if I have an initial value problem, which is the type of dynamical system that we have solved in your assignment and we did in the class, if we need to solve this analytically, we need to take differential equations first. We need to know, the, know about the characteristic rules, uh, homogeneous solution, particular solution, and all that. And that's the difficult path to go through. And we can get the solution. So I just gave you the solution in one problem that we studied. In the problem that you did in your assignment, you cannot even get a solution through this path because the problem is nonlinear. Okay? That's, of course, true also through this circular uh, path. If the problem is nonlinear, it doesn't work. It's always Laplace transform is also valid only for linear, useful only for linear systems. Okay? So what does the Laplace transform do? It takes that differential equation, subjects it to the Laplace transform, and crosses the problem in the S variable. From the T domain, from the time domain, we transform it into the Laplace domain. And in the Laplace domain, we will show very soon that the differential equation is transformed to an algebraic equation. Algebraic equations we can separate and solve easily. Okay? So that path is a very easy path. So you get a solution in the Laplace domain as an algebraic solution. Then we need to invert that because what we really want is the solution in the time domain to interpret it in terms of time. That really doesn't have any meaning. T has a meaning, right? So we need to use inverse Laplace transform to go back. And that is just a table lookup. In fact, both of them are simply table lookup once you understand the rules, rules of transformation. You can construct a table for forward transformation and reverse transformation. Okay? So it is very much like what you do in, uh, of course, you guys probably won't know about this. And also, uh, when I went to uh, school, uh, we used to actually use logarithmic tables. In an exam, we would take a logarithmic table. And if you need to multiply two complicated numbers, we didn't have calculators. To do the multiplication by tedious process is uh, time consuming. So we take the logarithm of the first number, logarithm of the second number. But from the table, addition. So in the logarithmic space, multiplication becomes addition. Okay? We add, and then we have an anti-log table. So we go back and find out what the product is. Okay? 
This is all new to you, right? You've never done it. <laughs> because you just punch the numbers in the calculator. But I could relate to it because I've done this. So when somebody presents to me as what you're doing with logarithms and numbers is the same as what you're doing with differential equations in the plus sign form. Taking the problem from a differential domain to an algebraic domain, solve it in an easy problem, and then go back to the differential domain. Okay? Any questions? So we're going to build this logarithm, this, this not logarithm, Laplace table. Okay, build this table of Laplace time solve. So let's take the most simple function that you can think of. F of t, so this is always going to be the t domain. This is f, and we are saying that it is just constant. And we are always starting from zero. What happens below that, I don't care. Okay? So the function is defined from zero to infinity. So the integration is from zero to infinity. And the function in this case is one. The function is 1, if I want the Laplace transform of that, then I need to multiply that by e to the power minus st, and carry out the integration, substitute the limits, evaluate it. And when I do that, uh, e to the power minus st, what is the integral of that? Simply e to the power minus st divided by minus s. s in this integration, in this integration as far as s is concerned, it's a constant. we are integrating only with respect to t. Okay? So s is treated as a constant, so I get minus 1 over s between the limit 0 and infinity, and of course the upper limit, what happens? As t goes to infinity, that's 0, because e to the power minus infinity, right? So the second limit will become minus or minus plus, which is 0, so e to the power 0 is 1. That's how I get 1 over n. Now these parts, I've written it down, so I may have a tendency to go fast. If you say it, I don't understand from this step to that step, please ask me, then I can explain it to you. Here it is. But if you accept it, that's fine, then we just keep going, okay? So the Laplace transform of 1, the function 1, is simply 1 over s. By looking at that, I would say, I'm not simplifying it, I'm complicating it, right? I take a function that's 1, and my transform function is 1 over s. It looks like it's more complicated. But you will see um, that it is indeed simplified the problem later on. Okay? So f of x, the transform variable, uh, uh, does not contain any information about t for t less than 0. Because the transform is defined only for t greater than zero. The other question one can ask, and mathematicians would love to ask such questions, is does this transform always exist for any function? Okay? And here is a result that we should, as engineers, should know okay, when a transform can exist, when it cannot exist, we are not interested in the proofs. Okay? So f of t exists, uh, I mean f of s, the transform exists, if f of t is piecewise continuous. What do we mean by that? What do you understand by that when we say it's piecewise continuous? You should have a pictorial view in your mind. So if I plot f of t versus t, okay, I can have a function like this, or I could have a function like this. Okay, then it jumps on the function, jumps on the function like this. For which one, according to this interpretation, can I expect to have a transform, and for which one I will not have a transform? Let's call it this A and B. I'm trying to see whether you understand the idea of piecewise continuous. A would be piecewise continuous. Okay, the derivative may be discontinuous, but it's a continuous function. At every time, there's only one value. This would be a discontinuous function. At this time, you don't know whether it is this or it is that. Okay, so that would be a discontinuous function. So this theorem says that as long as f of t is continuous, that plus transform exists. We can always integrate. That's one condition. The other condition is f of t is of exponential order as t goes to infinity. And they quote it in a complicated way. That is, there exists real constant k, a, and t such that this condition is satisfied. What does it really mean? And does it make intuitive sense to us? What are we doing in the Laplace transform? We are taking any function f of t, multiplying it by e to the power minus st, and then we are integrating it, right? So if I have a function that grows much faster than e to the power minus st, that is, it's growing up, okay, a function that is growing up as t goes to infinity, but at the rate, what is the role of e to the power minus st? As t goes to infinity, that e to the power minus st brings it down to zero nicely, okay? So that the function is well behaved. So what is the integral? Integral is nothing but area under the curve. 
So the area under the curve will be bounded. Right? But if I have a function f of t that's so obnoxious that it wants to blow to infinity, much faster than e to the power minus f t can bring it down. Then the area under the curve should be infinity. Okay? So in those conditions, Laplace transform is not defined either. Okay? That's what this part is saying. So it should be of exponential order f t equals to infinity, meaning the function should be growing at a period less than e to the power minus f t. Then e to the power minus f t can double it down to zero, and you'll have a well-defined area under the curve. Okay? Any questions? The next point is that it is a linear transformation. Now, do I need to explain this, or do you understand what I mean by that? Explain, or is it obvious? It's obvious. So it simply allows you to superpose. What I say is, if I have two functions, f1 and f2, and I multiply them by a constant a and b, and then I take the Laplace transform of that. That is the same as taking the Laplace transform of the first function, multiply it by a, and then take the Laplace transform of the second function individually, multiply it by b, and then add them up. And this linearity is a very powerful concept because it allows you to deal with individual transforms of simple functions and add them up together to construct the solution for a more complicated uh, differential equation. Partial fraction is something that I'm sure you have done. So this is what we will do. So we have to we'll review quickly what partial fractions are. So if I have a complicated expression in the transformed space, in the Laplace transform space, you can break it up into simple parts and then invert each one of them from the table and then I can add them all up to construct the solution. So it's a useful rule to know. <coughs> uh, this is just stating the obvious. The new variable is in terms of the S domain, not in the T domain. Okay? So let's look at uh, a few more transforms. This we already did. This is now called the step function, meaning the function f of t looks like this. Okay, it's still 1, and it is 0 before, and um, 1 for t greater than or equal to 0. We already saw the transform of that as simply 1 over s. Okay. Um, so in some books you'll find this. Any other function that we are going to look at is always multiplied by this unit step function. It's called a unit step function, step function because it goes from 0 to 1. And this function, in fact, is one of the built-in functions in MATLAB, as we will see later on. Um, it's a very uh, extremely useful uh, function to deal with. So what I'm doing here, I'm taking next the Laplace transform of an exponential function. Okay? So e to the power minus a t. A is some constant here. Okay? And I want now if I plot e to the power minus a t alone, how will it look? And t equal to zero, it's one. As t goes to infinity, that function is going to go to zero. What happens for t less than zero? It will continue its path like this, and it will actually go to infinity as t goes to minus infinity. Because when t is negative, negative or negative becomes positive, so it just continues to grow. So e to the power minus a t is a function that is defined from minus infinity to plus infinity. But we are not interested in anything uh, less than t equal to zero. That is why we multiply this by u of t. So when I multiply by u of t, what does it do? It truncates. So what I'm dealing with now is this function. So I'm asking what is the Laplace transform of exponential function only in the right half the mean in the time. From zero to infinity. So, what is the Laplace transform of this combined function? Okay. So, it is defined as zero for less than t, t less than zero, and e to the power minus a t for t greater than zero. So, we need to now every time we need to go through this uh, plugging in the definition. So, this is the function. This is e to the power minus s t as required by the Laplace transform rule. Carry out the integration, and you get one over s plus a in the transform variable. So A is a constant in this case. Okay. Any questions on that? That's all I'm going to show you. Then I'm going to present to you with a table, and the table contains most of the commonly used Laplace transform. These days, you don't even need the table if you have MATLAB. Next, I'm going to show you how MATLAB does Laplace transform and inverse Laplace transform. 
that makes the problem even easier. Okay? But um, if you want to do it by hand, uh, if the function, for example, is t times u of t, what is that function? It's called a ramp function. Okay? So it's always 0 for t less than 0, but it increases linearly. Okay? So it's simply t. And the Laplace transform of that is 1 over s squared. Laplace transform of any power law function, t to the power n, okay, is n factorial divided by s to the power n plus 1. So you simply look at the function on the left hand side and read what the transformed variable is on the right hand side. And to go to the inverse one, all you need to do is look at the one on the right hand side and find out what the corresponding function is on the left hand side. So this table gives you a way to go backward and forward. This will be included um, as a handout in any exam. One of the questions I think that I need to ask you sooner or later, this has a transform for various functions that we will commonly use, cos, sine, cos h, sin h, things like that. Whether you want the exam in a computer room or here, whether you want to really be able to do problems in that lab or you want to do it by hand, as we approach the exam day to discuss that. I want to first you to gain some confidence in that lab. Okay? <laughs> Otherwise, I know the answer. If I ask you now, I know the answer. <laughs> Okay, so the other one is, <coughs> it's called the shifting of the function. So if I have a function and I multiply it by e to the power a t, a again being some constant, okay, and then I take that Laplace transform, it is the same as taking the Laplace transform of the original function, and wherever you have s, replace it by s minus a. So this is called a shifting operator, just shift. Okay, and these rules are very uh, useful to know because uh, whenever you're multiplying it by exponential function, all you need to do is you don't need to worry about multiplying doing the integration. You find the transform of the original function, shift it by a. And similarly in the inverse domain, if I have a, a function that is shifted in the time domain by a, that is equivalent to multiplying in the transform domain d to the power minus a s. Okay? So the transform the original function. And if I have a function that is multiplied by a, Okay, then in the transform domain, it is equivalent to multiplying by 1 over a, f, s over a. I already have s, put it back, put it back, s over a. And there is a link here that uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, explore on your own, which just gives you these tables and more tables on Laplace transform. Okay. In fact, um, efunda.com is a good place for a lot of engineering information. Uh, conversion units, formulae, and fluid mechanics, a lot of things are there. But uh, this link is specifically to Laplace transform. Any questions so far? Am I going fast on Laplace transform? Yeah. No, the UT function has a different role. U of T is defined as a step function. U of T is defined as this function. So if I take any function, suppose I have some function that, that is like this, when I multiply it by u of t, what it does is it truncates it. It gives me only this part because it multiplies by 0 on the left side. So the purpose of u of t is to truncate the left hand side. Okay? And then take the integral on the right hand side. Now, uh, is that what we're talking about? Going back, uh, we did the uh, Take the Laplace transform of e to the power minus a t. So the function f of t in this case is e to the power minus a t. Okay, but e to the power minus a t exists for all values of t. So I multiply it by u of t to produce this function that you see here. Are you able to see? I'm talking sometimes, I'm not sure whether I'm pointing it or I need to have a better way of. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about this function. Okay, that is u of t multiplied by u to the power a t. That has nothing to do with the shifting property. The purpose of u of t is to truncate what is on the left hand side of a given function. Okay, um, and here this is the function f of t, and this is the rule for the Laplace transform e to the power minus f t. Take any function f of t, multiply by u to the power minus f t, and do the integration. Okay, that's what's happening here. 
Now, in the transformation rule, one can show by going through integration. So I'm just giving you the result. Okay? In the transformation rule, you take any function, f of t. It could, for example, be f of t is sine t. Okay? Then, if I want the Laplace transform of e to the power a t sine t, instead of multiplying this by e to the power minus uh, f t d t, doing all the integral, all I need to do is forget about this part, do the transformation, which I already have in the table. Okay? So if I go back to the table, um, in fact, uh, this is a good question that you asked. Here is sine of kt. Okay? The transform is this. Now if I multiply this by e to the power uh, something else, lt or mt, whatever you want, that transformation rule simply says that it is going to be shifted in s by s plus l or s minus l. And in fact, that transform is also there in this. e to the power minus a d sine k t. What does this say? It simply says s becomes s plus a. That's exactly what the transformation rule says. Okay? Find the transform of the original function, and if it gets multiplied by e to the power a t, then it is simply uh, changing wherever you have s by s plus a or s minus a depending on the sign of that. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, MATLAB demo. I forgot about that. Um, let's just generate. I need to introduce a new concept here. Okay? MATLAB, as it originally evolved almost 25 years ago, is an it's called, it's derived from matrix laboratory. So it was meant for numerical computations with matrices and vectors. Okay? From that it has evolved to be able to do something called symbolic processing. Now, have you ever been exposed to NAPU or Mathematica in any of the courses? No. A little. Do you have a rough idea of what the difference is between MATLAB and MAPU? MAPU can handle symbolic processing. Okay? What do I mean by that? Okay. Let's take some uh, expression here. Okay. Uh, one half plus one over three uh, plus two to the power four, something like that. When I enter a number, I'm making a fairly complicated arithmetic calculation. Okay. And everything is a number. When I type one over two, it's converted to 0.5. When I can one over three, it's converted to 0.333. But 1 over 3 is not just 0.333, is it? 0.333333 forever. It goes, right? So uh, if I want to be able to keep it as a symbol, then MATLAB, the recent, recent editions of MATLAB can do that. But I need to define that as a symbolic processing. So I'm going to enter the same command as, you know, the, key. Okay? the same command as this, but I put sim in front of it. What am I doing here? What do you think sim is, if you have to guess? It's a function. It's a built-in MATLAB function. It's just like sign, just like anything else, the function that you wrote. But it takes an argument. The argument is a set of numbers. But these numbers are treated as symbols. Okay? So what is it going to do? Let's try it. The previous one answer came back like this. Now it's taking a long time. What is the difference between this you see, this output you see and the output that you see on the top? It's the same expression I have added, right? But this is done as a symbol in fact in terms of fractions. Okay? So it does all the things that you will do when you did fractions in school. Okay, taking the common denominator and adding things together. So that is the net result of adding those three numbers. Absolutely. There is no error in this. Okay. Now, more interesting thing for you to see is, uh, you have a question, anybody? What's the standard? Yeah, what's the standard? 101 divided by 6. 101 divided by 6. Okay. And if you type 101 divided by 6, what do you think you'll get? Exactly. Now you understood. The difference between symbolic processing and numerical processing. Okay? So here, these are numbers, and it takes a number, 
and it divides and it produces the result. And when it does that, it introduces error because MATLAB cannot take infinite precision. If one precision goes forever, the MATLAB cannot do it. It can do up to 16 significant digits. So if I do format long, it will display the answer to 16 significant digits. So you can already see errors beginning to creep up in the maximal plane when it is the calculation numerically. So the way they did symbolically, they're passing it to the symbolic routine, which is what I did uh, here, it gives me the exact answer. Now, this answer is called a symbol. So let me just show another difference between the way that you can tell whether it's a symbol or a number. Remember, workspace variables all appear on the right-hand side. Okay? So if I do S equals, sorry. S equals this. Okay? So I'm calculating the symbol and putting it in new variable S. Now, S is treated as a symbol. Okay? So its attribute, if you look at it here, on the right-hand side, S is the label of sim. I guess you cannot see all of it there. I have a problem with this resolution not matching it is here and there and the recorder. <laughs> there are three things. Okay, so here you see the class is a symbol. Okay, so S is treated as a symbolic variable. Okay, since Laplace transform is all symbolic processing, we need to learn a little bit about how to set up symbolic variables and then you can take Laplace transform very easily. Okay, otherwise when it says it's double, it means it's a double precision number. It can carry up to 14, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. So by default, most of the variables that you will create in MATLAB are numerical numbers in double precision. Okay? So if you're using any symbolic variables, you have to declare them explicitly or pass them to the symbol routine implicitly. Okay? So let's do, there is a command called sin, which declares a certain set of variables as symbols. I'm going to do T and S, because these are two variables that you use in Laplace transform. So T and S are treated as symbols. And then I'm going to define a function F as uh, exponential minus A times T. And it's going to give me an error message, and I want you to be able to detect what the error message is. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to define a function. I'm not trying to evaluate a function. That's a big, big difference. Okay? So uh, let me show you that as well before. If I did a exponential of 4, what is it going to do? It's going to return me a number. Taking 4, this is like in the calculator pressing 4 and then exp. Okay? But if I say f is equal to exp of a times t, t now is a symbol. Okay? So it's going to define another function, symbol, f. And that's exponential of a to power t. So you need to be able to do this. If you have to learn on your own. What did I do wrong and what, how would I fix it? I didn't define A as that symbol. symbol. Okay. So all I need to do is put sim A. Then I re-execute this command. Now F is not treated as a number, it is treated as an expression. As an expression of the exponential of A times okay. Now there is a function called Laplace, as you would guess. That can take F and gives you the Laplace transform. So F has to be a symbolic expression, no matter how complicated it is. It has to be a symbolic expression, and it gives you the uh, transform of that. This is what we got in the table. What is the difference between what we have here and what we have in the table? Here you have e to the power of minus a t it gave us 1 over x plus a. Is that what I got? Not quite. In order to get that, what I should do is I should define the f as e to the power minus a t. Then I do the plus, you get 1 over x plus a. Right? And if, uh, this, if you don't store it in a particular variable, it automatically creates a variable for you called A and S. 
What is the attribute of ALS now? Is it a number or a symbol? It's a symbol. Okay? But that will keep on changing. For example, if I just type 2 times 4, now answer is 8, but it's a number. I've overwritten what was previously there. Now, to get the inverse, the command is I apply. So what am I doing here? I'm finding the inverse of 1 over A plus. Okay, so that should give me is that one? It is a thing, right? It just writes it as 1 over A plus minus A. Yeah. As far as, uh, that's a very good question, as far as uh, symbolic toolbox is concerned, both are symbols. But by default, T is treated as a distinguished symbol in Laplace transform. Okay, so it's a very good perspective to your question. If you really think about it, why does it treat T as a separate and not A? Why can't I treat uh, and take the Laplace with respect to A, right? So for that, you need to go and ask for help like that. Okay. Then it will explain to you um, how to use and how to change. So uh, Laplace of S is a Laplace transform. And here, T is treated as an independent variable. Default independent variable is T. And the default transform variable is S. But if you say, I don't want to use T, I want to use A as my original time variable and uh, something else, you can do that. And the way to do that is described in here. So, so you can change those symbols to the other symbols that are present for the original variable and the transform variable. Good question. But that, if you, are, if you don't want to worry about it, just deal with T and S. You'll always be okay with uh, MATLAB. Any other questions? So it gives you a lot of examples of very complicated expressions. Now, do you know the Laplace transform of a derivative? Do you remember? You must have seen it. That is the main reason for using Laplace transform, right? We want to get rid of derivative and convert it into algebraic expression. Okay. So maybe let's try this. Maybe we can. If I just copy that and enter it, what do you think will happen? What am I trying to do? This you should be able to do. If you develop this confidence MATLAB, you can learn on your own. Okay? You should be able to decipher it. And what is happening, this is an example that they have. I'm just going to execute that example. I'm going to venture to explain this. If it doesn't work, we'll see what happens. So what I'm starting with the inner most character. Okay. So S of T, I'm defining some function. I've really not identified whether it's exponential or function. Just some function. And I'm starting with the term. So all of this is going to return a symbol for me, which is S of T. And then I pass it to a function called DIFF. What do you think it could stand for? Derivative. So it's going to take the derivative of that function with respect to T, okay? And that derivative then is passed to the Laplace transform. So this is a function within a function that is within a function. So the way that it agrees with this transform in a row, takes the result, evaluates the result, passes it to the next one, evaluates the result, passes it to the next one, evaluates the result. Okay? And you can enter each one of them individually. Now, what is this value? And does this formula look familiar to you from way back? What I was trying to do was take the Laplace transform of a derivative of a function. And it did that, and it returned the answer. The answer it says is x times the Laplace transform of the original function. Because I didn't define what the original function is, it simply takes the Laplace transform of whatever the original function is. If I have to sign up to there, then it would actually take a Laplace transform of sign up t. But since I didn't specify that, 
just say the FRC will come trace folder for any function. So the same is relevant to the same as making as multiply by the class and some of the original function. Okay? Minus that original function is key put here. This we are going to show and approve very soon. Okay. Uh, just to show you that you can how to understand each one of them, I can break it up. If I answer this, what am I going to get? This is derivative of that function, right? But if I had said instead of that function, I had said x cube, what would I get? X is not defined. Undefined function or variable. Okay. How would I fix that? What was the problem and what are we trying to fix? Can you guess? What is the difference between these two? Here, x was undefined. It was not even defined as a symbol, right? So it's trying to evaluate x cube and its bond. Here, what I'm saying is take x, make it into a symbol, and then raise to the power 3, and then pass it to the derivative. Let's see what it does. So let's say it's the same thing. Where should I put it? Here? No. <laughs> uh, work on it. I'll also work on it. Let me just try the shortcut. Sims x. Okay. So if I take diff of x cube to the x squared. Okay. So if I specify an explicit function, then it actually takes a derivative. I put f of x there or f of t, then just a straight Okay, and we continue. We are out of time. So, next class, I will show you the proof of uh, what is the derivative of a Laplace transform, and then we'll begin to solve differential equations using that.